This past week, I had a conversation with a friend about God, the Bible, and Jesus. He said to me, I know that some religions claim to be the only true religion, the only way to live, the only way to God. Is Christianity like that? And I said, yeah, that's what Jesus says in the Bible. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father but by me. And by that, Jesus means that there is no way, no truth, and no life apart from him. My friend looked back at me and he said, Oh, I was hoping for something more tolerant to other religions. See, my neighbor represents the majority of people in our culture. We live in a pluralistic society. We want to see the good in every religion. But we need to be clear. Jesus was not that way. The Bible is not that way. Christianity is not that way. Now, is that because Jesus was intolerant and hateful? No. It's because Jesus loves people and knows that every other form of religion is a false hope. Jesus is our only hope in life and in death, my friends. Our sermon text this morning warns us about the danger and deception of false teachers and their false religions. So please turn with me in your Bibles to Titus chapter 1. Our sermon text is verse 10 through 16 this morning. If you didn't bring a Bible, like Jason said, it's okay. We have one provided for you at your feet. This text is on page 998. Titus chapter 1, verse 10 through 16. What we call Titus, a book in the New Testament, is actually a letter from the Apostle Paul to his ministry partner, Titus, whom he sent to help the newly established churches on the Greek island of Crete. Paul tells Titus that one of the biggest problems facing the church in Crete is false religious teachers. And friends, that wasn't just the big problem on Crete. That's a big problem in Winchester, Virginia. That's a big problem for our church. And whether you realize it or not, that is a huge problem for you and your family. False religious teachers. So let's read what uh, Paul writes about false teachers. And what we're going to see here in verse 10 through 16 is the problem and the solution to false teachers. And here's my prayer. Here's my hope for this sermon. My prayer is that we will all hold firm to the truth so that our faith will be sound. Let's read. This is God's word, Titus chapter 1, verse 10 through 16. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, Rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, 
not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure. But to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. That's God's word. That's Paul talking to Titus about the problem of false teachers and the solution for false teachers. Those are our two points this morning. If you're a note taker, please write that down. The problem of false teachers, the solution for false teachers. I provided a note sheet there for you. And if you're not a note taker, no problem. Make a mental note of it and follow along as we begin to look at this text. We're going to see the problem with false teachers. I want to suggest that Paul exposes seven major problems with these false teachers. First of all, note in verse 10, the very beginning, there are many and they're diverse. They are many and they are diverse. See that in verse 10? For there are, next word, many. This is not a small problem. This is a big problem on a small island. Imagine now, two centuries later, or centuries, two millennia later, how many more churches and how many more false teachers there are. Friends, this is a huge problem. It, in my opinion, I think we can show this from the Bible and you probably from your own observation that one of Satan's greatest weapons is religion. False religion. Religion that takes a little bit of the truth and then warps it such so that it becomes a, a pseudo gospel. And with this religion, he gives people false hope and actually leads them astray. We need to be careful of false religion and false teachers. We need to be on guard against them. So Paul tells Titus, there are many, and then look how he ends verse 10. They're diverse. He says, especially. What does the word especially mean? That means that there's a number of them, and he's about to point out one of them. So there's more false religion, more false teachers going on in the world today than just this one, but he's about to deal with one called the circumcision party. So friends, let's just stop for a moment and let's let the Bible, especially the New Testament, talk to us about the, the danger and deception of false teachers and their false teachings. Here's what Jesus said about it. Matthew chapter 7, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ravenous wolves. You're going to recognize them by their fruit. All of the disciples of Jesus who wrote letters of the Bible carried on Jesus' warning about the serious danger and deception of false teachers. Peter, for example, 2 Peter chapter 2. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction, and many, not a few, Many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Peter's got some pretty strong language, doesn't he? John, oh, the beloved apostle who just loves Jesus. John's got to be a soft tolerant man, right? John chapter 4, verse 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For 
many false prophets have gone out into the world. And by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, which you heard was coming and is now in the world already. Okay, John, we got it. How about Jude? Beloved, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. Why? For certain people have crept in unnoticed, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. These guys are serious about false teachers and false teaching. And, of course, the Apostle Paul, many different times. For example, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul warns about, quote, false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as the apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it's no surprise that his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. False teachers are many and diverse. It's one of the main problems that face the church in Crete, the church in Winchester, you and your family. So here's a question for you. If Jesus and every writer of the New Testament warns against the danger of false teachers and their false teaching, what false teaching most threatens you, your kids, and our church? Have you ever thought about it? What false gospel most threatens your soul. How do we know what to look for? Well, Paul's about to tell us. When he wrote to Titus, he told them, here's what I want you to look for. First of all, there are many, and they're diverse. Number two, continue in verse 10. They are insubordinate. You're going to notice a lot of these points are going to begin with the letter D. I couldn't find a D word that I liked as good as insubordinate. Now, you might think disobedient. Nah, too flat. These guys just weren't disobedient. Insubordinate is a lot broader, richer, more colorful than just simply rebellious and disobedient. Insubordinate means that they know the authority and they are not living up under the authority. So who's the authority? These false teachers are not under the authority of the apostles or the local church in Crete. They're insubordinate. They have their own agenda. Keep going in verse 10. Number three, they are deceitful. You see there in verse 10? They're empty talkers and deceivers. Empty talkers means that they talk about spiritual things, but it's worthless. It's empty. It's of no value whatsoever. And they're deceivers. What they say is truth is actually error, and therefore they lead people astray. So they're deceitful. Number four, verse 11 tells us that they're divisive. Look at verse 11. They must be silenced. Why? Because they're upsetting whole families. So I think you could read that in two different ways. I think the natural reading is whole families, like the, the, the families of mother, father, and children are being upset, like, like a boat that is typically stable and it's now capsized. They're upsetting whole families. They're bringing division 
into families and destroying the family unity. I think you could also read this as a household, which is a master, his wife, children, many servants, and then often people in the community. And guess what? That was the early churches. It was made up of multiple families that met in homes, not just that every dad is the pastor of his family. Every dad should shepherd his wife and children. But a church is different than a family. And in the Bible, churches got started out in homes. And so they would meet in usually a very wealthy person's home because it was large enough to hold everything. And so then that household, that church, is being divided because there are false teachers in that church. And by the way, I think it's important that we note that everything that we read here from verse 10 through uh, 13 and then on to into chapter 3 at the end of the letter of Titus, that these false teachers were not outside the church. They're inside the church. They're divisive. They must be silenced. Look over at chapter 3, verse 10, just probably across the page. Chapter 3, verse 10, as for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once, then twice, have nothing more to do with him. Not just simply talking about a rabble rouser or somebody who's hard to get along with. This is likely the, uh, those who have a false teaching, and they're stirring up division and getting people on their side in the church. So they're divisive. Number five, they're self-serving. Verse 11, in the middle, they must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. They're self-serving. They're motivated by greed. Notice that what they gain, Paul says, is shameful gain. That probably means that, that it's shameful because they're deceiving people with what they gain. They, they are making money off of deceiving people. So it's either their motivation or their method. But regardless, they're teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. Shysters who are in it for the money. I'm glad it was just on Crete. <laughs> and then notice in verse 11 that after he talks about, let's see, if you just look at your notes there, uh, let's see, uh, deceitful, number three, divisive, number four, self-serving, number five, that Paul says, and it's no surprise, verse 12, because we know the reputation of the Cretans, even one of their prophets a guy in 500 B.C., and I'm going to butcher his name, Epimenides, one of their prophets, 500 years before said this about the Cretans. Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. Do you see that? Liars, deceitful, evil beasts, divisive, destructive, lazy, gluttons, greedy, for gain. He said, verse 13, this testimony is true. Their false teachers are living it out right now. Number six, Paul wants them to know, especially if you look down in verse 15 and 16, that these false teachers do not walk around with the name tag on that says, hi, my name is false teacher. Okay, no blinking lights over their heads, no name tags. They don't give you a business card that says, I'm about to talk to you about something that is absolutely worthless. Don't listen to me. Number six, they appear to know God. But they are, and then just listen to the kinds of words that Paul uses to describe them. Words like defiled and detestable. Verse 15 and 16, to the pure all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving 
nothing is pure. Both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny God by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. These guys in the church, men, women, I don't know, surely men, maybe women, they seemed to know God. They appeared to be godly, spiritual people. But Paul says that uh, in God's view, they're defiled. That means that they are dirty, corrupt, and unable to come before him. They are detestable. That means an abomination to God. They are unfit. That means their life and their works have been put to a test, and they failed. So if they're not wearing name tags, and this is all we have to go by, how are we going to know? When we look at someone, when we listen to someone who appears to know God and be a spiritual, godly person, how can we know that they're actually deceptive and divisive? Well, here's the main problem, number seven. Save the best for last. Number seven, the main problem is very simply this. They're wrong on the gospel. They're wrong on the gospel. Verse 10, it says, especially those of the circumcision party. And then in verse 14, you should circle verse 14 because that gives us a definition of how they're wrong on the gospel. Verse 14, they devote themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. See that there, verse 14? They devote themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. Paul explains that they're wrong for two reasons. Number one, because they're devoted to Jewish myths. And number two, because they have turned away from the truth. There is a objective truth with a capital T. Not my truth, not your truth, but the truth truth. And Jesus said, I am the truth. Paul said that we hold the truth, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you should take that truth and guard it, give it to faithful men who will teach faithful men who will teach faithful men so that we can keep the purity of the objective truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ pure. It's not open for redefinition or rebranding. The main problem with these false teachers is that they're wrong about the truth of Jesus. They've turned away from it. So we actually get a better understanding of who these circumcision party people are and the Jewish myths from the other two pastoral epistles, 1st and 2nd Timothy. So we we learn some things here that whatever the Jewish myths are, they're, they're myths about Judaism rooted in the Jewish history. And then notice that their commands... And then look in verse 14. What do you think those commands emphasize? Verse 15, purity. So these are Jewish Christians who are emphasizing being pure before God by keeping certain commands, likely rooted in the Old Testament. There's other names for them, like Judaizers. But here, Paul calls them the party, the group of those who are circumcised, which is another name for the Jewish people. 
So these are emphasizing commands that are promoting purity before God. Take your Bible and look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. Let's get a better understanding of what these commands might be that emphasize purity. So same author, Paul, writing to his other ministry partner, Timothy, whom he sent to a big metropolis in Ephesus to help the church there. And he uses a lot of the same words when he talks about these false teachers in Ephesus. It's at the very same time in history, around 60, 62 A.D., <clears throat> when the church was just getting started, 30 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. So 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul explains the religion of the circumcision party, where purity comes through obedience to rules and what, what's called asceticism, which is denying the, the body, self-discipline. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, turn away from the faith, by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. You see a lot of, like if, you, if these are transparencies and you overlaid them, you're seeing a lot of the same kinds of words already. Verse 3, who forbid marriage. Spiritual people do not get married. Godly people do not enter into marriage. Verse 3, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good and nothing's to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving. For it's made holy by the word of God and prayer. If you put these things before the brothers... Timothy, you'll be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. So lots of similarities between 1 Timothy. You could go to 2 Timothy and find these same kinds of things. And in Titus... Can we just look at one more place? Colossians chapter 2. Colossians 2. What is this circumcision party? What are these Jewish myths? What are these commands that they're saying? If you obey these commands, certain kinds of commands, then that will lead you to be pure before God. Well, Colossians chapter 2, verse 16, same author, same kinds of churches. You're going to see a lot of the same words again here, writing to another church in Colossae this time. Therefore, let no one, Christians, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of what? Food and drink. Or with regard to festivals or new moons or a Sabbath. Those are all Jewish things. These are a shadow of the things to come. But the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism. And these might be some of the Jewish myths. Worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, etc. Look at verse 23. These things have, uh, indeed, they have an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. It seems that the circumcision party emphasized purity before God by beating down our physical flesh, 
so that we did not gratify any of the appetites of the body with the good things that God made. So things like marriage, which would gratify the body, stay away from it, it's base, it's sinful, just leave it to the pagans. You be holy in your body. But God gave us marriage. Yeah, but if you really want to be spiritual, then you'll be celibate. You'll live in a monastery. You'll just give yourself to Christ. Well, like the Apostle Paul. But God gave us marriage, friends. God tells us to to delight ourselves in marriage and let the marriage bed be undefiled. Why? Because the union of a man and a woman shows the union of Christ and his church. The unbreakable until death do we part covenant shows the permanent union of Christ with his church. But these spiritual deceivers come along with their empty words and try to make it a more spiritual thing where you're going to gain gold stars in heaven if you'll lay aside such base things. Paul says, and this is Greek, it's baloney. Don't believe them. The second thing that they seemed to emphasize was asceticism, which had something to do with foods, specific foods, drinks. You can see that in in these three different scriptures that we read today. And and we can understand that because the Old Testament had a lot of food laws, right? And, And so you can understand how Jews who become Christians and are starting to follow Jesus might keep those old food laws. But then Peter comes along and he's like, I had this vision. And on the vision came down a big sheet and it was like every kind of animal and it's all clean now. And God said, you know, we're, we're allowed to eat this stuff. And really, it was just a big picture of how the Gentiles are going to be part of the going to be part of the gospel now. And it served its purpose and it was a shadow, but now it's fulfilled in Christ. And so we're allowed to enjoy. But these guys came along and required certain commandments about foods. If you really want to be spiritual, if you really want to be pure before God, then you'll deny your basic human fundamental physical instincts and you'll be a spiritual person. Listen, friends, this is basically the lie of religion. This is religion in a nutshell. Tim Keller says it like this. This is how religion works. If I obey God, then God will love and accept me. If I obey God, then God will love and accept me. But here's how the gospel works. I am loved and accepted by God in Christ. Therefore, I wish to obey him. The gospel is that Jesus obeyed God never sin, and then gave his righteous life as a substitutionary sacrifice to atone for the sins of all of the guilty so that his blood will wash us from our sin. What can make me white as snow? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And that's what Paul goes on to emphasize in this little letter of Titus. Two different times in a major way, Paul emphasizes that purity only comes from one place. Jesus Christ and his cross. Look at Titus chapter 2 verse 14. Titus 2 14. Jesus gave himself for us. Notice these words to redeem us from all lawliness, lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. 
Purity only comes through the cross of Jesus Christ. Look at chapter 3, verse 5. God saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. How did he do it? By the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Purity only comes by the washing and regeneration of the Holy Spirit that is poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ. The false teachers get the gospel wrong. And that's how you can always know every false teacher. They get the gospel wrong. And so then in verse 15 and 16, Paul says, here's the result. The false teachers and their false result. They were wanting to be pure, but look at verse 15. To the pure, all things are pure, but what does he call them? Defiled. They're dirty. But to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing's pure. Both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their very works, these works of righteousness that they think are making them pure. And therefore, they are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for any good work. One of the commentators that I'm reading in this study, his name is George Knight, summarizes this nicely. He says, if the false teachers are detestable because they judge the work of Christ inadequate for attaining true purity, they are disobedient because they reject the good gifts of God's creation like marriage and certain foods, then they are also disqualified and unfit in God's sight, meaning that none of their good deeds are acceptable to God. How ironic and unfortunate for them. Their hope is nothing but a sham. So again, my question to you is this. What pseudo-gospel is most prominently waging war in your mind and heart and in your family and in our church? Listen, there's, there is no definitive answer to that question. But as a pastor, one of the elders of this church, I've just written down four dangerous and deceptive false gospels that I think are waging war right now on our church, you, and your family. First, charismatic theology. Many, many teachers. Many names for this. The word of faith movement, the, the name it, claim it gospel, the positive confession theology, the prosperity gospel, which says, if I live a certain way, then God will bless me with health, wealth, and happiness. All of these things are designed to help you maximize your potential to live a life of fullness and, quote, break out of your broken dreams and dashed hopes. Charismatic theology. Number two, religious pluralism. A culture that increasingly values every religion and increasingly fears being intolerant to any perspective, which leads to Christians letting go of the idea of an objective truth. And it opens us up to subjective individual interpretations of Scripture. What's the false teaching, the false religion that's waging war in your soul? Here's, here's another one that you might consider. Nationalism. 
emphasizing the superiority of any nation, in our case, America. It's putting an American flag next to God's word and seeing it, uh, Jesus as having the Ten Commandments in one hand and the Constitution of the United States in the other. It's a false gospel. The gospel has no borders. But above all those things, charismatic theology, religious pluralism, nationalism pales in, the cons in comparison to the age-old false religion of works. Just plain, I'm going to do my best to please God. And if I please God, then I will earn his favor. So if I deny my flesh, if I do the right things, then God will be happy with me and I will earn his favor. I'll stand before God, God and my good works, I hope, will outweigh my bad works. You can put all kinds of religious labels on it. or You might even reject religion altogether, but you still stand before God in your own self-effort. False hope, worthless and Jesus loves us enough to tell us that that might be your truth, but it's a lie. It's part of the broad road that leads to destruction. There is only one work that will merit favor with God, and that is the work, the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Through his life, through his death, through his resurrection, through his ascension, and now through his intercession. It is the work of Christ alone that is our only hope in life and in death. So we come to God not based on our works, but based on his work. We come to God not based on whatever righteousness we can scrounge up and present to him. We come to God in the righteousness of Christ, which is not only outside of us, but it is fixed and secure forever. For all who will believe in Jesus, that's the good news of Christ. It's not about you. It's about him. So that's the problem with false teachers. What's the solution? Very simple and much shorter. The solution, look at verse 13. Paul says, therefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. The solution to false teachers is elders who hold firm to the truth, teach the word faithfully, and rebuke with that same word. Paul sandwiches it. Before this section, look at chapter 1, verse 9. Speaking of elders, one of the qualifications in verse 9 is what? He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he might be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Why? For there are many who are teaching and believing. So the solution to false teachers are elders who hold firm, teach and rebuke with the word of God. Listen to what Paul said in Acts chapter 20. Paul was getting ready to leave Ephesus. He called for all the elders, so he had a little pastor's conference there. Paul addressed them, much as Nate addressed us this morning, with a full heart of love for these guys. 
He told them how proud he was of them, and then he warned them. Listen to this, Acts chapter 20. Paul said, pay careful attention to yourselves, guys, and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. For I know that after my departure, fierce Wolves will come in among you, not sparing this flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert. And remember that for three years I didn't cease day and night to admonish every one of you with tears. And now I commend you to God and to, are you ready? The word of his grace, which is able to build you up. Paul knew that if elders don't hold firm to the gospel, that there's a lot of stuff that's going to cause us to hold it lightly or turn our backs on it. Because frankly, there's ears that are itching to hear something, anything other than the, the objective truth of Scripture. And it's easy to capitulate to want to be praised by men. Give people what they want. He said, it's not just that fierce wolves are coming in from the outside. What did he say? Some of you. The solution to false teachers are elders who hold firm, teach, positive, and rebuke with the word faithfully. Did you notice there in verse 13, this testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply. Who's them? It's one of two people. It's either the false teachers or it's the people in the church who are believing the false teachers. You can make a good case for either one. Therefore, rebuke them sharply for, so that they may be sound in the faith, which is contrasted against those who have already turned away from the truth. You can make a good case. that The point is whoever has turned away from the truth, whoever doesn't have a sound, who has an unhealthy, diseased faith, should be rebuked. Okay, look back at chapter 3, verse 10. Lovingly, 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 graciously, graciously, then bring the hammer down. Chapter 3, verse 10, do you see that? Talk to them. Talk to them once, twice, warn them, and then church discipline. All right. So the solution to false teachers is elders who are going to hold firm, teach, and rebuke with the word faithfully, but friends, I suggest it's something else. It's Christians, too. It's Christians. It's not just the elders who say, hey, everybody, listen, there's false teachers out there and in here, but it's Christians who devote yourselves and hold firm to the truth yourself. You listen to the men that God has placed over you. You learn from them, and then you hold firm to it. So that you will be sound in your faith, never turning away from the truth. And you do that, friends, by studying the Bible, just like the Bereans did in Acts chapter 17. Acts 17, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, and they examined the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them therefore believed with not a few Greek women of high standard as well as men. Men and women, Christians, head down in the Bible, listening to the people who are teaching them, whether in their church, in their Bible studies, through the podcasts or social media, they're looking at their Bible and they're saying, is that true? Because I'm not going to accept it just because you, Mr. Popularity or Miss Bestseller, says it. We 
We do that by studying the Bible, and then ultimately we do that by valuing the gospel, grace, and glory of Jesus. He's the pearl of great price. And anything that begins to detract from Jesus, you say, no, 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 that's not true. That's not for me. As we studied this this morning, my, my prayer, my goal, my heart for you is that we will all hold firm to the truth so that our faith will be sound. And ultimately, if you're in Christ and you're holding on to him, here's the really good news. He will hold you fast. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion on the day that he returns. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for warning us about false teachers. Thank you for accomplishing, finishing the work of redemption so that now we can believe and be united to you and receive the benefit of it. And now we work because we've been made righteous. We've been made pure. We don't work to become righteous or pure. But now we have the freedom to live and enjoy your gospel. Thank you, Jesus, for that. I pray that you would protect our hearts and our ears from false teachers and their false teaching. And even as I say that, Lord, please keep me faithful. Reveal the error in my own heart so that I would never feed these beautiful sheep anything but your truth. Bless us as we stay faithful to your word because you're faithful to us. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand, friends. Let's sing about this, all right?